Brilliant. I tell you what I'm going to ask you to do is I'm going to ask you to jump to your feet this morning as we read the Word of God. Won't you do that? I know it's kind of up and down, up and down, but hey, um, we're going to read from the message because we want to honor the Word, and uh, I'm going to read it out of the message. It's from Matthew 9, chapter, uh, chapter 9, verse 27. It's the next story in our journey with Jesus uh, in His life here on the earth. Um, And it says, and Jesus left the house. Remember, he had just raised a 12-year-old girl back to life. Jairus' daughter had died. And uh, Jairus, Jairus, Liz, you're making me say the wrong word there, Liz. Sorry. But so Jairus' daughter had just been raised to life. He leaves that house and he's headed home. He was followed by two blind men crying out, mercy, son of David, have mercy on us. And when Jesus got home, the blind men went in with him, and Jesus said to them, do you really believe I can do this? And they said, why, yes, come on, master. And he touched their eyes and said, become what you believe. I love what the message says there. The ESV says, as according to your faith, It wasn't Jesus' faith that healed them. It was their faith. I trust that this morning our faith would reach out and grab whatever God has for you this morning. It's your faith. It's our faith. But you will become what you believe. (laughs) I don't know what you believe. You better be careful what you believe because you're going to become what you believe. It happened. They saw. And then Jesus became very stern. Kind of got his finger up like this. And he said, now don't let a soul know how this happened. I don't know how to even cope with that little statement. But anyway, but they were hardly out the door before they started blabbing it to everyone they met. And right after that, as the blind men were leaving, a man who had been struck speechless by an evil spirit was brought to Jesus. As soon as Jesus threw the evil tormenting spirit out, the man talked away as if he'd been talking all his life. He probably got all his words, both men and women's words, and he just, you know. And the people were up on their feet applauding. There's never been anything like this in all of Israel. Father, when we read this, we're so looking forward to the video in heaven one day. But until then, I ask you, Holy Spirit, to help us get a glimpse of what Jesus was doing. And Jesus, would you inspire us this morning through this word? As these men came walking in by faith, And they left walking by sight. Oh God, may we, who may have walked in here by sight, may we leave this morning walking by faith. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. All right, you take your seats. Brilliant. A few years ago, I had incredible privilege of experiencing probably one of my, it's certainly one of my top culinary experiences in my life, if not one of my top 10 experiences ever. You know those times where you, where you know that it was just an incredible immersive experience. I was in Hyderabad visiting a church uh, in the city, and after the church in the morning, they took us to a shopping center. And as I was walking around the service, I said to them, listen, I'd love to take you for lunch. Um, I know the church back home, Urban Life, would love to bless you. These people didn't have much. But I said, I, take your, pick your restaurant, whatever it is. Um, I know that um, Urban Life is generous and wants to do this. So I said, come on, pick your restaurant, let's go. And so we walked around and we walked up and down past some restaurants. And of course, you know, um, food in I- India is, is, is Indian food, um, the real deal. And uh, anyway, we walked upstairs and, and we stood outside a, a a restaurant that was like very different. It was like there was, there was no windows. 
There was hardly any signs. It looked closed. It was really weird. There was a guy standing behind the desk, and, and the guests, well, the, the hosts that were hosting me, she turned, and, and she said, and I could see the husband going, look, this is really expensive, but I, and I'm going like, is this a restaurant? And she said, yes, let's go. And I said, all right, let's go. And so we went there, and they said, we want all your cell phones, anything. Um, they took my glasses off. They gave me a little cubicle. I had to put everything inside there um, into wallets. The works was in my little cubicle, and, and it was locked away. And then we were, we were taken into like a, a, a room. It was very dimly lit. And the guy said, put your hands on the shoulders of the person in front of you. And, and then we did that, and then they turned the lights out. And they closed the doors and they opened the next door and we were led into this room that was pitch dark it, there was, it was dark I mean my eyes were open I could not see a thing and a gentleman came up and he said I will be your waiter he didn't say it like that he had the Indian accent on <laughs> and uh, we were about to be immersed in the world of the visually impaired or blind. And we were taken to a table and we had to feel our way and had to sit down and, and, and there was just, I mean, you feel the person next to you and, and it's dark. And for the next hour and a half, I was immersed into another world. A man came and he stood next to our table and he said, I'll be your waiter. And he we ordered food, um, and the food came. And, and we were not told what the food was. I can't remember the, the options we had, but I can tell you that on that plate was hot food, like in warm, and, and cold food. We were not given anything to eat with but our, what God gave us. We had spicy food and bland food. We had mushy food and crispy food. And as we would feel, and then with intrepidation, you would begin to eat, our senses in that moment were heightened. Because we could not see, we had to feel and taste and talk. And, and we were given some water and we ate, oh, this is not, wow, that's rough, you know. And you kind of, mm, what does this taste like? What do you think? And then, you know, of course, that really naughtiness in me comes out when I begin to tell them, you know what, I've heard that they serve, they serve really crispy rats here. And I'm like, ah, you know. And of course, we were going through, and no, it's got to be chicken. No, it's not chicken. And uh, we were having fun. We were laughing. And I was like so desperate to see others, but I could not see. And we were in immersed in this darkness and into this world of the blind. Of course, again, I, I, I had to, like, you know, I, I, I took my, the, the water and I thought, hmm, no one's going to know that. So, you know, I kind of just, I just did this every now and again, you know. And, and they were going, like, ah, ah, who's showing? Ah. Of course, I was the first one. I went, oh, no, who's throwing water? Oh, come on, guys, stop it. And they were like blaming everyone else, and they blamed the host, and it's like six, eight of us, and I'm going, oh, yes. <laughs> and then in the top corner, I saw like a little, ah, there's an the infrared camera here. They're looking. I thought, man, what a brilliant thing. So the, the time was finished. It was an amazing time. I walked out. I went to the desk. I said, I want to order the video. And they looked at me like, what? I said, you don't have a video of this? I said, I saw a camera in there, surely. They said, no, no, that goes back to head office just to make sure you Oaks don't do anything bad. I said, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Amongst the many things that I learned that day, <laughs> there's one thing I've learned, and that is to be really grateful for my sight. It just took an hour and a half for me. In fact, it wasn't even nearly that. As we spoke around the table, we went around. I said, guys, what is this meaning to you? And everyone said, so grateful for my sight. In fact, I'm really grateful for my sight today because of uh, the medical procedure that takes cataracts out of eyes. 
Uh, it's the most performed medical procedure in the world today. There's over 300 million people that have cataracts. I had this unfortunate, uh, found myself in the unfortunate place of a, in, the, in my 40s that I had cataracts. The first one, I couldn't understand why I couldn't see so well, and I went to, just like, give me a new lenses, and the doctor said, listen, I can't give you any more external lenses, but what I'm going to have to do is give you a new lens. And uh, I've told that story before in the gory details of, let me do it quickly, is they take a needle, they cut your eye with two millimeter slot, they suck out your old lens, which is now cataract opaque old, and then they take a brand new little fancy thousands upon thousands of rands worth of German technology, and they wrap up and it pops into your eye and it pops out with two like little arms and feet and hooks into your eyeball, and with instantly you can see 20, 20 Vision. It's the most incredible, and today I would be almost blind if I hadn't have had both my eyes operated on. I thank God for my sight. But this text that we read this morning has fascinated me no end. In fact, it has caused so much uh, kind of deep thinking and, and, and searching this week because I, I've looked at this text and I've, I've wondered because we've been in Mark and we've seen a progression in the gospel of Mark as Mark has told the story and we've seen how Jesus tells the, uh, the, the, the disciples and the crowd through a parable about the condition of hearts and he said there's four types of soil and within our hearts and if we want to have fruitfulness in our hearts we have to get to our hearts to be good soil and he preaches about the kingdom and we did that about three months ago as we looked at it and we've progressed as he finishes his teaching he said let's cross over to the other side and they go through a storm they cast out demons from a man they come back a, a religious man calls him to come and heal his daughter a lady with a disease pushes in and touches his hem Jesus turns his back on the religious man eventually gets to his house where his daughter has died he brings her back to life and then mark moves on and he leaves out the story of the blind men and the mute man and i'm going mark why did you leave it out but we got it in matthew so i'm going all right at least it's in matthew and so this is the next story and i go well what has the point of these two blind men now i don't know about you but when i read that story i think jesus was downright rude Take it like this. If I walked in here this morning, crowded people around the front door, I came late, but there's people there, and there were two blind people waiting, and I walked up the ramp and turned to walk in, and there was two blind men, and they said, Pastor, 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 pray for us, Pastor, pray for us, and I went, I would be on every social media platform in this country with the headlines pastor snubs blind men what was Jesus thinking what was he doing why I mean he follows a religious man he goes into his home, but he seemingly avoids the blind men. And I mean, hey, blind men, what chance did they have? I mean, I don't know if it's about you, but when I started reading that, I started to get, I wonder what was going on there. Hey, Jesus, son of David, have, have mercy on us. Where's he gone? Where's he gone? Hey, so maybe there's, there's two of them. Where's he going? Jesus! Jesus, son of David! Where are you? Hey, where did he go? Where did he go? Where did he go? Oh, oh there. Now, I don't know if the crowd was playing with him or whatever. But I find it incredibly... I'm going, God, what is the point? So on Wednesday... I was kind of trying to get my work done. Gareth, for his lead centurion, he's next door. He's in this text. He's asking questions. Next thing, he's popping into my office every day, and he's like, what do I do? And I think, Gareth, just write the sermon. I'll preach it, please. 
Okay? Just you do it, I do it. I don't understand the text. I'm not sure it is. You write it, I do it. Thursday comes in my devotion, and I, I'm going, God, what is the point you're making? On Sunday night, we were across at 3CI at the city celebration, and Ross Lester, who leads a church in Branston, he was preaching there, and he said what he was going to do was going to do something different. He was going to do, like the outcomes-based education, you make the point and then you work towards it. Because he says a lot of preachers, they w- preach for a long time and never make a point. I thought, probably me. <laughs> I mean, we have fun anyway, but um, do I ever make a point? I thought, Lord, what's the point? I want to get to the point. And I'm like thinking, I don't know what's going on here. And then I look across and on my shelf is my old paper Bible. Not that old, but... Um, I, I got the tablet, so um, the updated version of Moses' tablet. But I looked across and I thought, ah, let me go and, and, and look in the paper Bible. Maybe I, um, I can see a bigger picture of what God's doing. And I turned to Mark and I started to, to just, you know, get a big picture. I just started to look at it and le- read it and see the old markings, the markings that I put in my Bible. And uh, I noticed in, in Mark chapter 6, now I'm going ahead of the story where we are now. So what had happened is Jesus does a bunch of things. We'll get to that as we travel along. But one of the things he does, and I think you'll know the story, he feeds 5,000 men. They probably say between 15 and 20,000 people. Just a couple of loaves, a couple of fish, and the bread maker of heaven just bursts in, and he multiplies bread in the hands of the disciples, and thousands of people are fed. And then Jesus makes them, makes them. That word in, in the Greek means make, you know, like force, push down. He makes them, he kicks them, he, he shoves them into the boat and says, get across. And the last time they did that, they got a storm. This time they get another storm. Jesus goes up the mountain to pray and they are battling in the lake with, in the storm and Jesus comes walking and they think he's a ghost. And we know that when in the other gospels, Peter walks on the water, but here... Mark is writing, this is, in a way, many people believe this is Peter's gospel, the apostle Peter, who was giving it to Mark, Mark writing it, and he writes, and he says this in 52, because he says, Jesus, he got it in 51, he gets into the boat, the wind ceased, and they were utterly astounded, say astounded. Astounded. That word astounded, it means to be out of place. You ever felt out of place? You ever felt like something's happened and you go, what just happened there? That's them. It's like, what happened there? All right. And then it says, now this is Peter, or Mark, the gospel, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says, for they did not understand, say understand, about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. So something was going down in this journey, and The Holy Spirit highlights for us the fact that the disciples' hearts were hardened. So I thought, yeah, I remember that. Turn over the page, and now Jesus does some more miracles, and then he goes and he feeds 4,000. The bread maker comes back out again, and there is food for all. And, And then the Pharisees come. And they have this opposition against Jesus and what he's doing. And then Jesus says, okay, let's go across again. Let's cross back over. And he gets in the boat. And and in chapter uh, chapter 8, verse 14, it says, Now they had forgotten to bring bread, and they had only one loaf with them in the boat. Now, you've got to believe, if you live with the bread maker of heaven, what are you worried about if you bring one loaf of bread? Even if you have no bread, the devil knew that Jesus could turn a stone into bread. The disciples had one loaf. They had multiplied bread twice, but now they're going, we've got no bread, guys. And Jesus says to them, saying, watch out, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. Now what he's talking about there, Jesus saying, be careful of the influence of religion because religion is very external. It's, it's what you see with your eyes. Religion is very 
focused on what you see on the external side. And he said, then be careful of the influence of Herod, which is the political, the popular, the culture of the day, the fear of man. What do other people think? How do I dress? How do I? I'm amazed at, at what people are looking at all the time. A man came to me and he said, where did you get your shoes? I looked and I said, my shoes. He said, yeah, I saw them on the stage when you were there. Those shoes, I want a pair of shoes. I'm like, geez, you're even looking at my shoes. <laughs> and, and, and I use that because just bring it into our own content. I'm not saying we must become sloppy and not dress well, but I'm going, there is influence. And he says, and they began discussing with one another the fact they had no bread. And I've written here in, in my Bible, why does our thought life begin with what we lack? And I realized that what they were doing with this, they looked at their bread and said, we don't have enough. And when I come and I live my life and I, I realize that I'm in the same boat as the disciples because we need hundreds of thousands of rand for those speakers and we're going to build. And I go, Lord, we don't have enough. I look at the bank account and I've got one loaf. And I'm thinking, and I realize, I go, why does my thought life, why do my... my why is my inclination of my heart to go what we don't have? And when it should be to go looking back and say, you know what? God has given us multiple millions of rand and he has come through time and time again. He has never failed us. He has never, ever, ever, ever failed me. Never, ever. And yet I look at my lack. So it was my turn to go into Gareth's office. And we were having this discussion, and I couldn't quite wrap my head around it. So yes, the day before, he had gone for a walk. I'd watched him. He went out, and he walked, 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 walked. Then he came back, and he said, Craig, even the blind can find Jesus. That was his. And I said, brilliant. I wrote it down. So I go in there, and I'm going like, so he goes for a walk. Okay, I just need to go and see if something that's happening that we're doing outside. And so I jumped in my car, and I wrote, as I'm driving, God speaks to me. He says, so um, the disciples followed Jesus the longest and were the closest to Jesus. Yeah? So on that basis, you should be first in the queue. You should put yourself first in this category of hardness of heart. Because you know, you've been serving Jesus, you've been following me for nearly 50 years, you planted a church 23 years. Uh, the likelihood is that those who, who, who are meant to be closest and have followed Jesus the longest are the ones with the hardest heart. And I went, ouch. I came back and sat in my office. And I continue to read the scriptures, and I've read this, and I've grappled with this text. And I was invited to parties yesterday, and I said, I'm not going because I had to grapple with this text. And I've grappled, and I've grappled because it goes on, and it says, Jesus says to them, it says, and Jesus, aware of this, said to them, why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread? Never mind the fact that my thought life goes to my lack. I go and discuss it. Phone the bank manager. Any chance you can give me an overdraft? Because, you know, we've got to buy some speakers. God can't afford it. You know, he's, uh, he's given us millions of rand before, but I don't know if he can do it again. So can you do that? Do you not perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? I love the fact that Jesus is so amazing. This is the question that Jesus asked him. He says, are your hearts hardened? Now, if I was Jesus in that time, I would have told him, you guys, your hearts are freaking hard. What's the problem, man? And Jesus just so graciously says, he says, hey, guys, possibility your heart's hardened? He's kind of saying to me, Craig, possibility your heart's hardened? Having eyes, you do not see. I know what it's like to be blind. Having ears, do you not even hear? And do you not even remember? And that just stabs my heart. Because I'm going, you mean I can't even remember the last time when Jesus supplied? And it was just a few weeks ago when I stood with a couple of young guys. And I said, you know what? You're going to move. You need to go into the barn. You need 40 grand. Go. And I walk away. They say, God, help me. 
And then the next day, 40 grand comes in the account, and I get up here and I say, remember, oh, God is good. He gave us 40K. Brilliant. And now I go, I don't even remember that two weeks ago because I'm, I'm hard. I'm hard. My heart. Well, if, if hardness of heart is not seeing, not hearing, and not remembering, he says, when I broke the five loaves, he's just helping them remember. In verse 21, and he says, and he said to them, do you not yet understand? I said, there's the point. Right there, there's the point. He says, guys, we've got to get to the root of the matter. You're looking at the fruit, get to the root. And the root is a root of understanding. And, and I looked at that and I said there, and right next to it is Matthew 13, 15. And so I quickly rolled back into my Bible and Matthew 13, verse 15. Oh yes, Jesus was, was telling the parable of the sower. He said the kingdom of God comes representing another kingdom. A seed comes from another kingdom. It's coming to a heart. And he says, you know, that seed can fall on rocky. It can can fall on hard soil, pathways. The birds of the air steal it. Or it can fall on just shallow soil, and it grows quickly and then just withers. Or it goes into rocky and weeded soil where it flourishes, but the, 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 the concerns of the world and the things of life choke it out but it can fall into good soil and there it will produce 30, 60, and 100 fold. And the disciples go, Jesus, we don't understand the story. And he says, okay, I'll explain it to you. And he explains it to them. And he actually quotes out of Isaiah. He quotes out of the, 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 the text about himself um, that he would come and he would open the eyes of the blind and that he would open the ears of the deaf and that he would heal the cripple and he gets to that thing and he says um, he talks about understanding with the heart you see our western culture wants us to understand with our head we are cerebral and we work things out in logic but the kingdom of God is not logical. The kingdom of God is all about experience. And God doesn't want us to just know Him here. He wants to know through experience. He wants to immerse us into a world that is foreign to us. And He will take us through circumstances that seeming like go through doors and darkness comes upon us. And we are blind because we need to understand and experience what God is doing amongst us. And He will take away our sight maybe not physically but we will be blind we may even be deaf and we may come back to a point where we've never remembered what God has done in our lives but he wants us to experience his grace and his favor he's wanting he is so so uh, there is such a compassion upon his heart that he doesn't want to leave us in logic he wants to immerse us into a kingdom world And I go, God, I'm so hard of heart. And now you're going to be praying for me because you have a hot pastor that's got a hard heart. I hope you do. You see, the condition of our hearts determines the fruitfulness of our life. Understanding, when Jesus said, do you not understand? The biblical thought there is, have you not experienced? And you know what I've realized? That we can go through experiences and they don't even affect us. There's some that absolutely put us into a total wobble. But there's sometimes we don't even experience. And... A man said to a Chinese man, they were teaching English, and he was in this kind of conversation, and he was teaching him, and he said, coffee grows only in cold, in in warm climates. Coffee only grows in warm climates. We know that, hey? Coffee grows in warm climates. That's what he said to this man. 
He says, England is a cold climate. Then he asked him the question, does coffee grow in England? And the answer is, does coffee grow in England? And the Chinese man answered this. He said, I don't know. I've never been there. It'll sink in. <laughs> you get it? And the problem is we live in a world of mathematics. We live in a world of logic. We are immersed into a culture. And our whole upbringing is this. One plus one equals two. And we logically work it out. And when we come to the gospel, we want to logically work it out. And God says, I'm not logical. I'm fully experiential. He says, I don't want you to know you in your brain, in your head. I want to know you in your heart. I want your heart to know me and know me through experience. The title of my message today was Hide and Seek. But then I came across this incredible quote from Jackie Pullinger. Jackie Pullinger, as a 21-year-old girl, bought the cheapest boat ticket she could. It ended her in Hong Kong, and she began to minister to those who were drug addicts, dropouts in the most poorest, most crime-ridden area of Hong Kong. An incredible story. But she said this, God wants us to have soft hearts and hard feet. The trouble with so many of us is that we have hard hearts and soft feet. And when I read that, I realized that that was my condition. And that's the condition I think that for many of us find ourselves in. Is that, oh, we come to Christ like those blind men. We walk by faith. We, we come by faith into to Jesus and we find mercy and salvation. It's not by anything we could do. We were blinded by our sin, and we found the Savior. In fact, Jesus found us. The reason Jesus ran away from those men was they wanted to make him messianic king of the day. It's the first time they said, Jesus, son of David. That was a messianic title for a king of their day. They wanted freedom from the Romans, so they wanted to make him king, earthly king. And Jesus didn't want to be their earthly king. He wanted to be their eternal king. And so he goes away because he doesn't want, he, he pushes away fame. Oh, so different to today, isn't it? All we want is fame. How many followers do I have? How many likes did I get? Come on. And we look for fame, and Jesus just shuns fame. He doesn't want to be an earthly king. He wants to be the heavenly king. But we come like those men, and those men found their sight because of their faith, and we get salvation because of our faith, and they walked out there and were disobedient to Jesus immediately. Just don't tell anybody. They went, oh, yeah. Now you may say, but... Actually, they were disobedient. And I go, you know what? I think we're just like that, don't we? We come to salvation. We find salvation through faith, the grace of God. And we walk out, and we walk by sight. And we think we can do this life. And we no longer walk by faith. But we're actually called to walk by faith and not by sight. And so what happens is we come with this blinded, sinful heart and God makes a new creation and we are born again and the Spirit of God comes in us and everything is brand new. And we go, wow! And our lives change and we go home, we tell our families and it's amazing and the grace of God is incredible and we've got these incredible soft hearts and we've got faith. (laughs) Our feet are like, we will walk anywhere. We'll tell anybody anything about Jesus. We are bold. Man, we've got hard feet. We've got the feet of gospel, you see, because Ephesians says, that you must take 
the gospel of peace and wrap it around your feet. We need cold foot Christianity. And we go, yeah, I'm just, you know, genuine, authentic. We're walking everywhere. It doesn't matter what happens. Ain't us don't talk. Oh, man, my heart is soft and my feet are hard. And we're just, the kingdom of God is coming. And then something happens somewhere, three months, four months, a storm in the night. Lack of finances. We stomp our toe. We stand on a thorn. We go, no. Ah, 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 ah. Where are you, God? Why are you doing this to me? My family, my marriage. I thought I gave my life to you. What happened now? And all of a sudden, our hearts become hard. And our feet become soft. And we stop walking. Am I preaching to anybody this morning? Is it a bit anar? I said, oh God, I want a soft heart and hard feet. Thinking of the time I read that book on Shaka Zulu and his impies. Remember, you would drive them through thorns so their feet would become hard and calloused. And I realized that the devil, all he does, he wants to turn that around. He wants to give us calloused heart. He wants to get us offended, hurt, angry. He wants us to stop loving. He wants us to stop feeling. He wants us to stop experiencing God. And we, and we put it on and we stop and we get... <laughs> On holiday, Andy and I, we, wanted to, we went for a walk down the beach, and we left our shoes. We walked down the beach. They said, this beautiful beach. And we went through, met somebody, and they said, hey, just go over the rocks, and there's another whole beach. We went over these rocks, and there was this beautiful white beach in the, in the Transkai down the wild coast. And we wanted to get there, so we're going. But the rocks were like razor sharp. And we're like, ah, 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 we've got city feet. Ah! And we're like, come on, we can do it, we can do it. And we get like, not even a quarter of the way. And we go, it's not going to happen. And we walk back. Ah! We go, oh, soft feet. Ah. And we missed out on all of what God had for us. Because our feet are not shod with the gospel of peace. Come on, let's stand together. Spirit of God, would you come and rain upon our hard hearts? Would you come and do a sovereign work this morning? As we prayed, as we began this morning, we may have walked in here by sight, but we want to walk out by faith. You are worthy of your name. You are worthy of your name. You are worthy of your name, Jesus. Come on, let's just turn our hearts towards him. I didn't get to what I, all that I wanted to preach. But I think that over the next few weeks, the title of the message will be Soft Hearts, Hard Feet. And that's the point. That's the point that Jesus is making. And we're going to work towards that over the next few weeks. We're going to walk and we're going to, we're, going to, we're going to toughen up our feet and we're going to soften our hearts because we want to experience the kingdom of God in a way that we have never, ever done before and that we would walk transformed into a great future with our King. And we ask you, Jesus, that you would come now by your sovereign grace. And start a work 
within each one of us. Maybe if you you hear this morning and that this message has rung true in your heart, you've realized that there's been areas of your heart that are, that are hard and your feet are very soft. You've stopped walking. Something has happened in your journey, in your walk with God. Maybe it was years ago. Maybe it was days ago. Maybe it was months ago. Maybe it was even decades ago. And that there's someone here this morning that has given up on God. You've, you've got angry with Him. You have, you've stubbed your toe somewhere, not your physical toe. But today is the day. Make this day of that day that you look back on, that you come and you go, you know what? I'm going to continue to walk no matter what. I want tough feet and a soft heart. And this, we're going to take just a few moments to incline our heart to our God. The quickest way to a soft heart is to lean on God, to incline ourselves. Just kind of incline ourselves through this song. Jesus, you are worthy of your name. Let's sing it together. Come, guys. Sing like you've never sung before.